happy Friday out there in uh, video land. Got a uh, walk-in freezer. Discharge line had a hole blown in it. Looks like it shorted out, but at least it's outside and not in the box, huh? This video is brought to you by Heatcraft Refrigeration Products. We got a service call on a walk-in freezer not working. And that literally just happened on camera. What the? <sighs> okay. So, evaporator fan motors are running. They had called me last night, but they didn't want us to come out. And they said they had a red display and there's an active alarm. Uh, when I walked up, the condensing unit was not running. Uh, ice cream is liquid, pure liquid. Fun stuff. Okay, we gotta get over there and see what the alarm is. This stuff. <laughs> I tried to climb over here and then more boxes fell. <laughs> Good grief. So they just got their delivery apparently. But yeah, everything in here is liquid. So active alarm, click on that, high box temp. So it's just saying high box temp. Um, let's look back in here. It doesn't look frozen up in there. It's gonna be hard for you guys to see. I cleared out the alarm and uh, we're going to box temp. I'm just looking through the monitor thing to see what is going on inside here. Set for negative 10. It's a freezer. It's, it should be calling right now. It says cooling. Let's see what the EXV is set to. Evaporator's 30 degrees. Coil temp's 30 degrees. Suction temp. Suction pressure is 0.2. So we have no suction pressure. EXV says it's open 100%. That's scary. Why do we have no suction pressure and the EXV says it's open 100%? Uh-oh. Correct voltage. Yeah, let's go outside. They're condensing units out on the back dock, and uh, this is not good. I don't know what gas is in there at the moment, but we've got no gas in the system, high side or low side. So that stinks. Um, looking around for signs. Condenser's dirty, but I don't see signs of oil. There might be something right here, maybe? What is this? These are all jacked up. No, I don't think so. I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, this thing's beat down. But uh, yeah, I don't know where this problem is. This thing's got no gas in it though. I'm gonna have to have them uh, put that delivery away before I can get in there and really start troubleshooting the box. So this has gotta be a big leak because it's completely out of gas. So I'm dumping a bunch of nitrogen into the high side right now. I've got disconnects turned off on both units so that way I can hear this one. The EXV is open because it's flowing through to the other side. So let's turn it off and see if we can hear. Yep. It's leaking in here somewhere. So it's actually a good sign. Because that means that, you know, if it leaked out inside, then theoretically they could have pulled a bunch of moisture and everything in. So there's going to be less moisture being pulled in from a leak out here because it's dry and hot. So I'm gonna get this guy opened up and see if we can figure out where this little leak is. Like I said, I didn't know what gas it was. It's actually 448A. So um, there's a crack on the discharge line right here. Totally repairable. It was right underneath this guy. So just rubbed out or something. Oh, uh-oh. No, it didn't rub out. Look at that. It's shorted. I think it blew a hole in this guy. Short it out, I think. That's my thought. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe that's what that looks like. I've never really stared at one of these. I thought it was sealed at the end. But regardless, it doesn't seem like it blew too much oil out either because this just happened yesterday. And if it blew all the oil out, you'd see it. It'd be everywhere. And it doesn't look that bad at all. So, okay. Shouldn't be a too big of a deal to fix. From the looks of it, that is a hole. And this thing is going to be bad. This thing... It had it blew a hole in it. I, I didn't know if that little hole in here was normal or not But I don't think it is because I think I've looked at these before So I think what happened was this shorted out and uh, Blew a hole in the discharge line and surprisingly it didn't lose all the oil Go figure All right, um got it all sanded up what I'm likely gonna do here, you know I'm gonna probably just go ahead and swage a piece of half inch and connect it from here to here and cut it out. 
and uh, just braze it in and then we'll get a new dryer on it and get it on the vacuum, get it running, pulling down. All right, so here's the bad piece that I cut out. I went ahead and swaged a piece that is just a little bit bigger on each swage joint so it should fit right in there. And then I've got a new sight glass and dryer. I don't really care much for these sight glasses. They're a little difficult to see so we're gonna put a, a big nice Sporlin see all sight glass in there. Give us a little bit more visibility. Um, yeah, so I've got a couple extra pieces of copper and stuff. We're gonna throw it in there. So let's see what we can uh, do here. So my torch tip was a little too small. It was a zero. We're gonna roll with a rosebud on this one. It's gonna be a little hot, but we'll do it quick and it'll make the job go a little smoother. So changing to the rosebud, you got to make sure that you have your pressure set right. And each tip has a pressure guide. If I remember right, I believe the rosebud is like 7 to 15 oxygen and acetylene, something like that. So I'll usually go like 10 and 10 on the rosebud. I got the dryer removed, we're gonna mock everything up, get the new one installed, and then we'll do the brazing all at once. That looks pretty good. So now it's brazing time. Blowing nitrogen the entire time. Got a little uh, wet rag heat blocking compound to protect the dryer, the sight glass. So uh, we'll get this guy brazed up real quick and get this guy over here brazed up. Pressure test and evacuation on it.
right, we're all brazed up in here. That's kind of hard to see, but I need to check it with a mirror, cool everything off, make sure we didn't damage the glass. Sometimes these side glasses can be a pain to braise up. You can damage the little element inside of it. It's not the end of the world, but you know, I'll have to take a look at that, but I'm gonna inspect everything with a mirror first. The evacuation is running. I'm doing a one hose pull right now. I've got my micron gauge on the suction line service valve right there. The evaporator is independently powered and the EXV is open, so we've got flow through the system. We're pulling through the liquid line. Couple things to note. Number one, you always want to put the caps on, okay? Because service valves, king valves like that one, the caps right here, and these caps. Schraders always leak, valves always leak. Nothing's leak free. So always do that. Next thing is I started my vacuum pump with the gas ballast open. The gas ballast is a way to pull out as much uh, non-condensables out of the system without contaminating the oil in the vacuum pump. So essentially it bypasses the oil and it's just a suction on the system. But to get a deep vacuum, it needs to go through the oil. So what we do is we open the gas ballast right now, usually until I see about a thousand microns. Right now we're at about 1800 microns. Once I get below a thousand, and this is a true vacuum, mind you, because it's pulling through here, okay? And um, we're going to, uh, once we see a thousand microns, we'll shut the gas ballast and continue the evacuation. I went ahead and closed the gas ballast a little early. We're, usually it's, it's anywhere between a thousand and two thousand microns in my opinion, and I'm sure someone can correct me, but I shut it down. Now the interesting thing is when you're doing an evacuation, especially on a system like this, even though we don't have a lot of humidity in the air, this thing's been down probably all night, probably since sometime yesterday. So there is gonna be moisture in that oil and we're not gonna be able to get it all out. Okay, it's almost impossible to get all the moisture out of the oil. Inevitably, we should do an oil change or something, but right now, the priority is to get the equipment running. Okay, so we're gonna pull the best evacuation we can, uh, you know, but we may have to do an oil change in the future. We do have an active moisture indicator in the sight glass. It did not get burnt up, so that will help us to know if there's a lot of moisture in the system. That'll change to a yellow color. So we're gonna let it keep running. But one thing I do wanna point out is as your evacuation starts to stall, you can actually look at the oil and you can see the oil level moving. And sometimes you'll even see bubbles popping up in that. See the oil level moving? What's happening is the air, the non-condensables and the refrigerant have been trapped in the sump in the bottom of that oil and it's slowly boiling out. So if you wanna speed up the process, you can energize the system, turn on the crankcase heater, which will heat up the body of the compressor. You can also agitate the compressor gently. You don't wanna shake it too much. And what you'll notice a lot of times when you agitate it is the evacuation will jump up because you're releasing some of the non-condensables and refrigerant vapor from that oil uh, in a faster manner than it would naturally be released. So, and then you'll actually see a drop off too. You'll see it spike and then you'll see it drop even faster as it's able to pull the system down faster, okay? So uh, we're still running on this guy. We're gonna let the evacuation go for a while. Um, it's probably time to do an oil change on that oil too because it's been about two or three vacuums. It doesn't look too bad, but I think I might do an oil change. Uh, the cool thing about this one is I can do an oil change while it's actually running, so. All right, uh, it's time to charge the system up. Um, I'm going to open this king valve. I still have a micron gauge over there, so I'm not gonna remove the micron gauge until we get positive pressure in the system. So basically, I've zeroed out this scale handle, and then also I'm able to read it on the manifold too. It's zeroed out on there. So we're gonna go ahead and open this up, and I know that the maximum refrigerant charge on this unit is 14 pounds of R448A and we're weighing it, and we know that with 14 pounds, with the line set length and everything, that is the maximum amount of refrigerant we can safely put in this system, and that will adequately have enough refrigerant to flood the condenser when the head pressure control valve goes into bypass mode if the ambient temperature drops too low. And that was a mistake on my part. Shouldn't have done that. I had the system on, but life happens, okay? We're still charging right now. What had happened was it came back up on the low side and uh, turned the pressure control on because I had the system on to energize the crankcase heater. So wanna be careful, but no harm, no foul. It's okay, it's not a big deal as long as we caught it fast enough to where we didn't flood the compressor with liquid refrigerant or anything too bad. 
but we're just charging. Now I know I'm not gonna have enough gas in this system or in this tank. I've actually got someone bringing me another drum, a refrigerant and the uh, discharge line thermostat. So I have him picking that up right now, but we're gonna get it operational here as quick as possible. Now it's taken about five pounds of refrigerant. I need to talk to them. They need to replace the insulation on that walk-in cooler. But um, it's taken as much refrigerant as I could get into it by just dumping it in the high side. So I've now shut down the high side and we're gonna charge the rest in through the low side and meter it in slowly. Now again, I know I don't have that much more refrigerant, so I'll put in what I can and hopefully it's enough to get us running until my tech gets here with more refrigerant. Well, it looks like I got just six pounds out of this tank and it's pretty much done. So it's definitely not enough refrigerant. Okay, we've still got a fl somewhat flashing sight glass. It's not perfect. And again, the system, the total charge is 14 pounds. So, but we know that it, I think it's gonna run for now. Uh, I'm gonna do some cleaning up. My technician is heading this way. He'll be here in about 45 minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and rinse off the condensers. Um, it is currently, I don't know if you guys can see that. It is currently 107 degrees, 108 degrees outside. It's about 11:14 a.m. Not even close to the hottest part of the day. I imagine we'll hit about 112, 113 here today. Um, so we are running abnormally high head pressure. That 119 on my gauges is not accurate. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and rinse the condenser, get that going, and then just wait for my technician to get here. It's doing pretty good. I rinsed it off. The head pressure dropped significantly, significantly. Um, it's still wet, so it's gonna drop a little bit more but and we're still not properly charged also I guess I should change it over to the right refrigerant 448a there we go so saturation temperature is about 91 so we're still low definitely right side glass is still flashing but the electronic expansion valve is doing everything it can to keep the system running even with low refrigerant uh, now I want to talk about a few things um, Number one, I get a lot of questions about these condensed units. So this is a heat craft condensed unit. And there's a couple things in here that are a little odd that people don't understand. First off, this particular unit has got this little chingus right here that goes into the compressor. Okay, what that is, is that is a form of liquid injection. Liquid injection is a way that we help to cool off the internals of scroll compressors under high compression ratio situations. Now, a couple different methods. This is like a fixed orifice metering device. There's a capillary tube method, and there's also a temperature responsive expansion valve, or uh, Copeland has a name for theirs, a DTC valve, a discharge temperature controlled valve, okay? The DTC valve, which is what you'll see on the aftermarket situations, you'll see this little fixed orifice metering device on the factory situations on the smaller condensed units. Um, but in an aftermarket situation, you've got this little well in the top of the compressor. If we had to change this compressor, we can literally pick up the compressor and the supply house will have a DTC valve. The little uh, sensing bulb goes in the top of the head of the compressor. There's a little rotor lock nut right here, it threads onto there and then it typically pipes into the liquid line. So if you look at this one, liquid line coming out of the sight glass goes into a line right there that goes to a solenoid valve. There's a current sensing relay in here. When it senses the current of the compressor running, it opens this solenoid valve and injects liquid refrigerant. Now, this is typically for high compression ratio situations. If you're using 448A, it tends to run higher compression ratios on low temperature. Um, even with 404, uh, liquid injection is a good idea on the Copeland scroll compressors. Um, so it's really not that confusing. A lot of people get kind of confused. You know, sometimes you might call the supply house and be like, ah, oh, this valve on the side and they don't know. All you got to do is just go into the Copeland mobile app and look up the compressor model number, then look for accessories and it'll tell you the part number for the actual DTC valve. So it's not that big of a deal. You don't need to be overwhelmed by it. Now, the other thing that's a little different is this guy right here. This is a suction check valve. This is there to help prevent short cycling in the off cycle. So oftentimes, uh, the Copeland scroll compressors, the easiest way, it's not the quite correct term, but the easiest way to explain is the compressor unloads, okay? Uh, the floating seal on the top of the compressor, when it shuts down, it doesn't like to pump down to low pressure situations. So if it sees that weird pressure differential, it'll actually relieve the pressure and it'll quote unquote unload. 
and what can happen is the suction pressure all of a sudden can go up and you'll hear it in a sound it'll make a sound like a blow-off valve or something and when the compressor shuts down you'll hear it go and then all of a sudden you'll hear it turn back on and then it'll just get caught in a vicious cycle so what they've actually done is installed a suction line check valve right here and they put the low pressure control on the other side of the suction line check valve in hopes to prevent the short cycling due to uh, the compressor um, you know, bypassing that refrigerant and just doing that vicious short cycle back and forth. Now another thing too is uh, you also need to be setting the low pressure controls correctly on these guys. Uh, Heatcraft has recommendations, Copeland has recommendations on how to properly set the uh, uh, the pressure controls because it's not just a matter of just because that suction check valves there that it solves the problem no you still need to set your pressure control accordingly too um, now on the non intelligent condensing units heatcraft will install a, a time delay relay that will prevent short cycling too and copeland actually recommends that on almost all of their compressors is that little time delay relay uh, usually ran in series with the, 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 the low pressure control or something and it just basically creates a time delay before the compressor contactor will pull the compressor back in so all right this thing's doing pretty good so far so we're gonna let it keep running and again I'm just waiting for my technician to get back all right we got it all charged up so um, my technician brought me more refrigerant I had originally put in six pounds from that other drum and then I put in another eight from this one so for 14 pounds max and I know that when I did the startup with 14 pounds of refrigerant, if you pump it down and check the liquid level in the receiver, that's the liquid level. So in case someone has to do a leak repair in the future and it doesn't completely run out of gas and they don't know how much gas had been lost, they could literally just fill it up to that mark. So at this point, we're going to let the system run a little bit longer. Go check on the vitals over at the intelligent display inside the box. So we're still getting a high temperature in the box, but that's typical. Box temp is set for negative 10. It's actually 12 degrees in here. Um, let's see what the superheat's at. It's running. Superheat's 14 degrees. Coil temp's zero. Suction temp's five. Suction pressure 16. Expansion valves open 67 steps. This thing's kicking butt. So I'm gonna reset the error codes, but you can see that with the intelligent display, it's super easy for the manager. When they think there's something wrong, they can you know, uh, verify it because they come over and the display gives them an error. So I really do appreciate that. Um, and it lets them know, you know, and then they can even tell me over the phone, hey, it's saying high box temperature, you know, and then, you know, it gives me some ideas before I come out. So that's pretty cool. And everything's looking good out here. I mean, uh, 118 degree saturation temperature, about 110 degree ambient temperature. It's pretty cool how efficient these micro channel coils are, you know, it's only a 10 degree condensing temp over ambient on this guy. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put this guy back together. We'll still watch it come down and then I got to put the evaporator, you know, tighten all the screws back on on the evaporator back together. But so far we are looking really good. So I came back outside. I put a new discharge line thermostat, moved it over here. Um, this guy has a slight vibration in it. I don't know if there's damage in the compressor or if it's just, you know, no big deal. We're definitely going to monitor that because there's a slight vibration. But the, the, the hole in the pipe was an electrical arc that blew a hole. It wasn't like a crack. So we'll keep an eye on that. But I moved the discharge sensor just a little bit over there, wired it in. But then I opened this up and that contactor looks bad. It's all burnt inside and what gave it away was that white powder on the side. So I'm going to go ahead and replace the contactor too and then we'll start it back up and hopefully be done with it. Look at the points of that contactor. That was about to be an issue. So big picture stuff here. Don't ignore the contactors. Um, that's going to potentially cause a single phase failure and ruin a compressor simply because of that contactor. And when those points are that pitted out, they're not making a good electrical connection. They're gonna lead to voltage drop and all sorts of issues with the compressor. So, got that replaced. I gotta go reset the intelligent because I had shut off the condensing unit, so more than likely it's off on a um, low superheat or something like that error. So we'll go reset that and then put this condensing unit back together and tell them to keep an eye on it. 
whenever you're doing a repair on an existing system, right, a system that's been in operation for a while and there's a catastrophic leak, right, and it loses all the refrigerant, it's going to be really difficult to get all the moisture out of the system, okay? There's, there's something that everybody needs to understand is a perfect vacuum on an older system is a very difficult thing to get, okay? Now, um, you, you do the best that you can, right? Uh, as long as you have good tools. Now, I had a 10 CFM vacuum pump coupled with the hoses that I had. Uh, it was doing a great job, okay? But there's still just moisture in that refrigerant oil, and it's going to be almost impossible to get it out. In this situation, sometimes you have to make a judgment call, and you have to decide, okay, do I need this system operational, right? Or do we do a complete oil change? Do we go through everything? And in this case, they needed the equipment running, okay? So what I did was I pulled the best evacuation that I could. Now, in the end, uh, the evacuation got down to about 600 microns, and that's about as low as I could get it. And, and it came up and decay a little bit, but nothing crazy, not like a refrigerant leak or anything, right? It was just moisture boiling out of the oil. So just do the best that you can. Now, in this situation, I, you know, let the customer know, hey, I put an oversized liquid line filter dryer in the system. We put a new sight glass that has a moisture indicator. And I highly recommended to them that they let me come back in a couple weeks and do a system evaluation and change the refrigerant oil. Now, I haven't gotten approval to do that as of yet, but we'll see, okay? And I'll keep monitoring the equipment. I'm actually, of all things, going back to this customer tomorrow to work on an air conditioner, so I'll follow up on the system and see how it's doing. Um, but, you know, the, you have to obviously take into account everything, right? Every situation is going to be different. The customer, the location, the situation, um, you know, where the refrigerant leak out is huge, okay? This one leaked out outside, and it really didn't blow the oil out. You could clearly see that there was plenty of oil still in the compressor. Had it happened inside the box, we would have had even more moisture intrusion into the system, okay? But it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Now, I did my best, uh, put a new filter dryer, sight glass, repaired the leak spot. Um, I At the end, I showed that I was a little hesitant uh, because there's just an ever so slight vibration in the compressor. Nothing like crazy, but just a little bit. I mean, the camera wouldn't have even caught it because of how small it was. But it's just definitely something that I noticed, so we'll keep an eye on that too, okay? Now, I do want to address a few things. Now, with the uh, Heatcraft Intelligent display and the evaporator that it has, if the customer wanted to do so, they don't in this situation, but if they wanted to put the web server card in, I know I have a web server card sitting around here somewhere. I don't know where it is, but um, there, there's a little web server module that you can put onto the evaporator, and then they can plug the evaporator into a router, and you can actually set it up to give you alerts and different things like that. So uh, for whatever reason, a uh, majority of my customers, this particular customer, they don't want to have their systems connected to the internet. But if they did, my gosh, the possibilities are endless. You know, they could have seen, you know, I could have gotten emails. I could have gotten alerts, right? So it's really cool with how technology is changing. And the customers are a little slow to come on board with it. They're all afraid of getting hacked or whatever. But, you know, honestly, they could do it the right way. They could have their IT people come in. And there's things they could do to protect the system, to protect the location, but for whatever reason, they're a little reluctant to do so. But if they did, if they put that web server card in, we could be notified even sooner than this, right? Then, then they actually just went in and, and looked and said, hey, there's a big red light. What does that mean? But, you know, like I said in the video, too, you do have to appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, even though they don't have it hooked up to the Internet, right, but... Um, they can see, you know, they can see a visual display. They can see a giant red light that says, hey, there's a problem. So it's not just them. And what that can do is, you know, oftentimes you'll get calls from customers. They'll be like, yeah, well, you know, it was warm yesterday, but I thought maybe it was in defrost. Well, with the intelligent display, they can walk up and say, no, it's not in defrost. There's a red light saying high box temp and it's not saying defrost, you know. So I really appreciate that because it, it helps them be more aware of what's going on within their systems, okay? I really, really appreciate you making it to the end of the video. Thank you so very much. Uh, if you haven't already, please consider checking out my website, hvacrvideos.com. We have merchandise available, a bunch of different stuff, hats, beanies, shirts, all that good stuff. Um, again, thank you so very much. Please, please, please remember, with all the craziness going on these days and all the animosity, the hate, the fear, the anger, 
just, you know, be kind to one another, right? Remember, you never know what the other person's going through. I, I, I'm not going to justify a single thing. I'm not going to justify a person being a jerk or anything like that. But just remember, okay, they could be having the worst day of their life. And while it isn't justified the way that they reacted to you or made you upset, just remember, they could be going through the worst day of their life, okay? So be kind to one another. I really, really appreciate you. And uh, we will catch you on the next one, okay?